This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory and Le'ilu Nishmas Dayan Chanoch Aaron Troy, the head of the Beit Din in London and one of the most impactful and influential rabbis in Europe over the last half century. He passed away this past week. His passing is a huge loss for the Jewish communities of Europe and, of course, the entire Jewish people. And all the people who were fortunate enough to know him and to have a relationship with him, may his soul be elevated in heaven. Today we're going to do something a bit exotic, a bit unusual for us. Part of our Parsha, Parsha's Vayetze, is so inexplicable and so thoroughly demands an explanation And looking back at the previous six years of the Parsha podcast, I don't think I offered a satisfactory explanation for this part of Parsha's Vayetze. And you know, in our Parsha, we learn that sometimes it's okay to wait seven years for something really wonderful. Some things are worth a seven-year wait. Jacob worked for seven years for the rights to marry Rachel. He actually did it twice. But this podcast from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, together with me, your host, Yaakov Wolby, RabbiWolbyJubin.com, we're going to try to cover a part of the Parsha that perhaps we have overlooked in the previous years, and that is the Sheep Saga. Our Parsha contains a considerable amount of time and words and verses focusing on Jacob as a shepherd after working for 14 years for the rights to marry Rachel and Leah. Jacob begins to work for pay as a shepherd for his father-in-law, Laban. And the description of what ensued is quite lengthy. There are, in fact, entire books of Talmud that yeshiva students the world over spend a year plus studying that are based on fewer verses in the Torah. And we read all the details. They make an agreement. Jacob gets to keep all the speckled and spotted sheep. And Laban gets to keep the rest. And they start off by removing all the speckled and spotted animals so that Jacob does not have a biological head start. And Jacob takes a bunch of pieces of wood, rods of wood, and he manipulates the mating environment of the animals, and all the animals are born with speckled and spots, and Jacob becomes very rich. That's the short version of the story. But it never really made sense. You know, why is the Torah focusing so much on the sheep? Why is there such an emphasis on this saga of the sheep, and the deal, and the arrangement, and how Jacob behaved, why is it so important? Why is this sheep saga salient? Now, there are other questions that we can ask surrounding the sheep. When the parasha begins, or when when Jacob arrives in Laban's hometown, so he goes to the well, and There's the big stone upon the well, and there are three groups of the three flocks with three shepherds, and they're waiting for a critical mass to come roll over the large stone. And then Rachel comes out, and she, like Rebecca, soon to be her mother-in-law, currently her aunt or aunt, she comes out, and she's a shepherd, and she is overseeing the sheep that belonged to her father. So if you read that verse, it seems like there are some unnecessary details. This is chapter 29, verse 9. Rachel was coming with the sheep, and the sheep belonged to her father, and she, you should know, is a shepherdess. So it seems to be a little bit verbose. That's another question we could ponder. Now, after Jacob spends a couple of weeks with his cousins and his uncle, He wants to marry Rachel, and he volunteers to work for seven years 
as Laban's shepherd for the rights to marry Rachel. And then we know the story. After seven years of hard work, Laban does his trickery, and instead of delivering Rachel as the bride for Jacob, he supplants her with Leah, and Jacob is a bit disappointed, and he tells Laban, "What? why are you tricking me? Why are you deceiving me? And he says, well, you know, th- th- this is what we do over here. First the, first the older daughter gets married, then the younger daughter, but seven more years, and Rachel is yours. And Jacob willfully signs up for another seven years after he was deceived. If we were to judge Jacob's negotiation skills, it would seem to be quite poor. He could have started off by saying, well, I'll work for you for six months or a year and a half. Right away, he offers seven years for the rights to marry Rachel. Evidently, Jacob did not read the book, never split the difference. Why is Jacob making the first offer and committing to seven years and then doing it all over again, what is going on? What is Jacob's calculus? Now, after the 14 years are done, Jacob stays for the seven years and he makes an agreement, a work for you, Laban, for pay. And what's the pay? You keep all the monochromatic colored animals. And all the ones that are speckled and spotted, those will be mine. Why specifically does Jacob want the speckled and the spotted sheep and not the monochromatic, the white or the black ones? And finally, when the deal is in place, Jacob manipulates the mating environment of the sheep to produce sheep with the desired speckled and spots. And he takes some rods of wood, and while they're mating, he makes them look at this wood, and that produces progeny that are, by right, Jacob's. But it seems to be a little bit unethical, shall we say. Certainly not what you would expect from Jacob, who is the paragon of honesty and of integrity, and of truth. What do we make of Jacob's studious efforts to acquire Laban's sheep, the speckled and the spotted? So this is, of course, a part of the parsha that we read every year. And it's a quite, uh, quite a large parsha. And there's so many things going on. There's so much drama in our parsha. But every time we got to this point in the parsha, it seemed that there's something hiding beneath the surface. It seemed to be quite Kabbalistic. You know, the Torah is not telling us random stories about Jacob's exploits as a shepherd. There's something going on over here. And it never quite made sense to me what is actually hiding beneath the surface. Now, this year I saw something Incredible, a bit wild, certainly eye-opening. And as I mentioned at the top, it's a bit exotic. And it's not what we typically do over here. But I feel like you have to have, if, if this is going to be the Parsha podcast, you have to have an explanation of the Parsha. And when you have something so mysterious and so inexplicable, like this whole saga with the sheep, it's incumbent upon us here from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, to offer an explanation. And this is the best one I have seen. It's interesting, though you've been warned, it's a bit exotic. Let's begin. The Kabbalists tell us that there were some very lofty souls that were destined to be the souls of the Jewish people. But something happened to them. They were degraded. They were implanted in other places. And there's a long story behind it. With the sin of Adam and Eve, these souls 
this spiritual force that's going to comprise the Jewish people, they were sent back. And they ended up in the generation of the flood. And there was more corruption. And they were sent back. And they ended up in the generation of the dispersion of the Tower of Babel. And they came back amongst the members of Sodom and Gomorrah. And every time these souls reappear as humans, they seem to be blundering and doing terrible things. And after they were given three chances, they had dropped to such a low level that they came back and were resubmitted to this world, not as humans, not even as animals, not even as plants or saplings or grass, but in inanimate items such as stones. And then Abraham came along. And Abraham, he fostered, or he brought about, he effectuated a transformation of spirituality in the world. And his improvements elevated everything in the world. And those special, special souls that have tremendous holiness in them, but unfortunately made some poor decisions and were now languishing in rocks and other inanimate objects. Thanks to the efforts of Abraham, they were elevated from the inanimate to being on a level up, one level higher spiritually, into the plants and trees and grasses. And then came along Isaac. And again, another titan, another one of the patriarchs. This is Isaac. And he brought about tremendous revolution, spiritual revolution in the world. And all those souls were once again elevated from the plants and the saplings and the shrubbery and the bushes and the brambles into the animals. They are one step higher on the spiritual totem pole. And these souls are now animals. Which animals? Which animals are these souls now currently incarcerated in? They made their way to the sheep of Laban. And Jacob invested assiduous Herculean effort to take those souls and elevate them to the next level so that they can be humans once again. These souls eventually became human souls, the descendants of Jacob, and they were subjected to hundreds of years of servitude in Egypt. And once these souls had gone through this whole cycle of penitence, they were ready to be the souls of the Jewish people at the foot of Sinai and to found the grand, illustrious nation of the Jewish people. And there are even some accounts of people who remember previous lifetimes, even though this is not uh, as well documented as you would hope, but there are claims of people who said, well, I remember when I was uh, the previous reincarnation. Oh, I actually remember my time as a sheep for Laban. When we talk about the sheep, the Kabbalists are revealing to us something very powerful. I promised it would be exotic. I think it is undeniably so. What they're telling us is that there's a whole emphasis, a whole discussion here about Jacob and the sheep and the and the sheep of Laban, who eventually the spa speckled and spotted. There is tremendous emphasis on sheep in our Parsha. According to the Kabbalists, the entire episode of the sheep of Jacob contain very deep, profound, cosmic consequences. Jacob, and together with his family, are trying to extract the souls, the lofty souls, of what's going to be the Jewish people 
who are currently trapped in said sheeps. Jacob is trying to rescue those souls that will eventually comprise the Jewish people. They're implanted in the sheep, and Jacob is trying, in ways that we cannot even fathom, to rescue and release and free those souls. Now, when we're first introduced to these sheep, their shepherd or their shepherdess is Rachel. And the verse makes a big emphasis on the fact that Rachel is the shepherdess. It tells us that she has those sheep and they're the sheep that belong to her father and she is the shepherdess. And again, it seems a little bit wordy. It seems like we're getting some redundancy here. But according to this understanding, it's not just a coincidence. These are not random sheep. These sheep gravitated to Laban because they contained holy souls that needed further elevation and rectification. And thus they went specifically to those sheep because these sheep contained a shepherdess like Rachel who gave them a chance at redemption. And then Jacob comes along. And of course, he's aware of all of this. And again, I want to stress, I don't know how to do this. I cannot tell what souls are trapped in what animals or what rocks or what plants. This whole thing is just operating at a very high level. But this is what our state has revealed to us. Jacob volunteers to work for seven years. After seven years, he volunteers for another seven years. And we pointed to Jacob's very apparent poor negotiation skills. But here's what's actually happening. Jacob estimated that it would take him seven years of intense focus and spiritual elevation to extricate those holy souls from their confinement. That's why he volunteered to work for seven years with those sheep. And for seven years, Jacob worked dutifully to try to separate the sparks of holiness from the ordinary sheep and to release these souls, these powerful souls, from their confinement so that they eventually can become operational as human souls, the souls of the Jewish people. And then he volunteered for seven more years. And the reason why is because what happened after those seven years actually undid all of his progress. Due to the events of his bungled wedding, he lost all the progress that he had made over the preceding seven years, and he had to do it all again. For someone like Jacob, when he was with Leah, and he, at that time, he was thinking about Rachel. This was an event that disrupted his spiritual standing, and it corrupted and undid and reversed the tremendous strides that he had made over the course of seven years in releasing those souls. After seven years of progress, they once again became deeply embedded within the sheep once more. And he had to work for seven additional years to release them. Now, after 14 years, we have the additional six years where he stayed and worked for pay. And the deal was, I keep the speckled and the spotted sheep. And Laban, you can keep the monochromatic sheep. Now, why did Jacob choose specifically the speckled and the spotted sheep and leave Laban with the other ones? Here's the answer. After seven years of separating the holiness from the mundane and releasing those Jewish souls, 
Jacob understood that there were still some vestiges of holiness embedded within the flock. There were still remnants of holiness that needed to be released. And that is what Jacob set out to release over the final six years of his time with Laban. Most of the souls were already elevated, but some vestiges of holiness remained. So after 14 years, Laban's flock consisted of a mix. Some of them were just ordinary sheep. And some were holy ones or had some sparks of holiness still within it. But how do you spot, no pun intended, which animals contained some of the holy souls? So again, the Kabbalists tell us, if it is just one color, if it's uncomplicated, if it contains no admixture on a superficial level, then you know that it does not have any admixture on a spiritual level. But if it is speckled and spotted, or even if you can evoke some speckled or spotted characteristics, if it shows some inconsistency, if there's some conflict, if there's some dissonance, if there's some lack of equilibrium, then it indicates that it still contains some elements of holiness, of a soul, of someone who is destined to be part of the nation. And that's why Jacob targeted those animals in particular. Now, with this understanding, we have a different view of what Jacob was trying to do when he was manipulating the mating environment to try to see if there's any way to get some speckled or spots on those animals. He knew, he understood that those souls are really his souls. This is the nation that he is founding. And Laban only got them due to his righteous daughters. And Jacob understood that he was required to unearth and discover and eventually release those souls for the benefit of the nation and of the world. And the Kabbalists add that when Jacob arrived at the well and there's a large stone capping the well, and he just rolls off that stone when he sees Rachel with the flock, and he doesn't wait until they're are sufficient shepherds to roll off the well, the Kabbalists reveal that there's something else going on. These sheep that contained holy souls, they were under the thumb of Laban. And Laban was spiritually asphyxiating them. And they were on the brink of being spiritually decimated. And it was a matter of seconds, of moments. It was critical to give them some water. And therefore, Jacob, without waiting for backup or reinforcement, he rolls off the well cap and gives them to drink, thus infusing them with spiritual vitality. Because when they drank the water from Jacob, they were spiritually revived and allowed to exist and live another day. Jacob was worried that maybe some of the sheep that would be bearing holy souls or sparks of holy souls, would be disguised, would be indiscernible, would blend in with the other ordinary sheep. And therefore, Jacob strove, after 14 years, to have them birth spotted sheep. He didn't want to leave any holiness on the table. He didn't want to allow any soul left behind. And he worked to ferret out those dormant souls. Now, I want to stress, Jacob knew all of this, and we have no idea. We're just talking. We're just reading what the Kabbalists tell us, and we have no idea how to do this. But now we have an understanding of an otherwise inexplicable part of the Torah. 
Jacob is preparing the process, is laying the groundwork for the Jewish people. These special souls who were damaged and terribly reduced due to the sin of Adam and Eve and the generation of the flood and the generation of the Tower of Babel and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, Jacob was trying to get those souls out of their spiritual confinement and prepare them for their day in the sun as members of the glorious nation that Jacob was to found. I want to add a few more points to this. In the past, we've spoken about the Luz bone. This was so memorable. If you were part of the Parsha podcast family, then you won't forget it. The Luz bone. What is the Luz bone? So, say just tell us there's a bone. One bone in the human body that does not benefit from regular food. And therefore, when Adam and Eve did the sin of the consumption of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, there was one part of their body that did not benefit from that food and therefore was not subjected to any of the curses and consequences that were brought about by that sin. That sin subjected humanity, condemned humanity to mortality. On the day that you eat it, you will die. You will be subject to death. But there was one tiny bone, the Luz bone, that did not partake in the sin and therefore was not subjected to that decree. And when we spoke about this at length, we talked about how the only food during the week that this Luz bone partakes in, it's only the food that we eat after Shabbos for the Malav Malka. And when the person dies, really, there's one part of them that's still alive. The one bone that was not subjected to the decree of Adam and Eve is still alive, whereas the rest of the body is dead. The Luz bone is still alive in perpetuity. For eternity, the way things were intended to be, if not for the sin of Adam and Eve. And this bone is going to be instrumental for the resurrection. When resurrection occurs, it's not that there's a completely dead and lifeless body that is brought back to life. Rather, there is actually one part of the body, the loose bone, that is still alive and that never died. Provided, of course, it was fed with this Malava Malka after Shabbos. And that spreads life, injects life and vitality to the rest of the body. So this term Luz, it always symbolizes this idea, this notion of finding some latent living holiness, some holiness that's not damaged, notwithstanding all the death and destruction everywhere else. Now, the word luz appears twice in our parsha. At the beginning of the parsha, when Jacob has his quite memorable dream, with the ladder and the angels ascending and descending, when he wakes up in the morning, he renames the mountain. He calls it Beit El, the house of God. But the verse tells us that it was previously called Luz. Now, the connection of the Luz bone to the name of the city called Luz, it's not my idea. The commentaries point it out. So, for example, Rabbi Bachai, he tells us that the reason why this location, Beit El, which is also, of course, Temple Mount, it was called Luz as well, It's because the resurrection, which is associated with the loose bone, it's going to start in Jerusalem. And that's why Jerusalem also shares the name with this bone. It's also called Luz. But I had a different idea that I wanted to speculate. And because this is my podcast, I'm allowed to speculate. You can speculate too. Send me an email over to 
Jacob renames the mountain Beit El. And the Talmud tells us that this is a reference to the third temple. We had two temples, the first temple, the second temple, and the third temple will be built during the Messianic era. We hope it happens really soon so we could go there and experience it and be elevated as a result. But the Talmud tells us the book of Psachim, page 88a, that the first temple corresponds to Abraham. Abraham renamed the mountain Har Yerah, the mountain upon which God will appear. Abraham referred to Temple Mount as a mountain. And that corresponds to the first temple. When Isaac rendezvoused with Rebecca for the first time, he had come from a field. And that field is none other than Temple Mount. And that corresponds to the second temple. So Abraham referred to the mountain as a mountain. Isaac referred to the mountain as a field. And Jacob, in our Parsha, refers to the mountain as a house. Says the Talmud, the third temple is going to be corresponding to Jacob, and it's going to be like a house. It's going to have a degree of permanence and eternality. And that's why the name associated with it is one of permanence, of a house. So perhaps we can speculate. Jacob renames the mountain Beit El. And the Talmud tells us that's referring to the building of the third temple. May it happen speedily in our days. But previously, meaning before the third temple is built, it's called Luz. That means that in its current state, 2022, the end of 2022, When the temple has not yet been rebuilt, it is still like the Luz. It's like the Luz bone. Before it's named Beit El, before the third temple, it's like the Luz bone. It's still alive. There's a still a a point of holiness. There is a point where it hasn't been destroyed. There's a point that's bursting with eternal holiness, even though everything else around it is dead. That is the state of Temple Mount in destruction. It still has a simmering ember of life and undying holiness, like the Lisbon that can never be destroyed or extinguished. But when it is rebuilt, when the holiness that was always present in this small point gets spread to its entirety and revives it completely, then it is totally alive and permanently so. And then it's called Beit El. When envisioning the third temple, Jacob notes that it was previously Luz. Previously, before the temple, the third temple is built, it had a point of inexhaustible holiness amid a dead mass. And then, with the building of the third temple, it will be transformed into a permanent house of God. Now, this is the first time that the word Luz appears in our Parsha. The second time is when Jacob manipulates the mating environment of the sheep. This is chapter 30, verse 37. He takes several rods of wood. What kinds of wood? Was it oak? Was it mahogany? Was it Canadian pine? What was it? So, the Torah tells us it was Livnelach. It was fresh shoots of poplar, and it was a wood called luz, which here is translated as almond. And a third type of wood, but one of the types of wood that Jacob uses is called luz. Now, of course, we have this question here, why does the Torah need to tell us the variety of wood that Jacob used to place in front of the animals. Of course, that seems to be like such a triviality when the Torah always is very, very sparing in its word usage. So that's a question we have to ask in general, but it's definitely not a coincidence that one of the types of wood is called luz. 
And again, I think the principle is the same. Luz represents the idea of, of indestructible holiness that exists. It can exist within a person. And that's the Luz bone that we talk about. It can exist in a place like in Temple Mount. And maybe this is what Jacob's trying to do here with the sheep. The souls that are so depressed and suppressed and incarcerated in those sheep, there's still some luz there. There's still some point of holiness that's indestructible. And that's what Jacob's trying to do, to invoke that flickering spark of holiness that's still within those last sheep, the ones that were not redeemed by the first seven plus seven years. He's trying to find that that little point of luz, that little point of holiness to bring it out and to raise it to the surface and to extract it. Now, just as a side note, another point, we're told that the location of the luz bone is on top of our spine, where the brain connects to the body. I believe it's called the medulla, if I'm not mistaken. Probably should have Googled this before I started recording here in the Torch Center. But there's a point where the brain connects to the body, where the spiritual touches the physical. It struck me that the temple, it's called Luz, our verse tells us, but it's also described as a neck, which is the same area where the Luz bone exists in a person. How do I know that? Because later on in Genesis, chapter 45, verse 14, after Joseph, no, spoilers, spoilers alert, Joseph reveals that he is in fact Joseph, not some fearsome Egyptian viceroy, and he falls upon the neck of Benjamin, and he cries, and Benjamin falls upon his neck, and he cries. And Rashi tells us that uh, there's something going on here with the next. Why Why the next? Why the crying? Says Rashi, quoting from our sages, Benjamin, in the future, not just the individual Benjamin, but the tribe that Benjamin will head, when they get to the land of Israel, the land that's apportioned to them will include Temple Mount. And therefore, Joseph, many, many hundreds of years before the temple is even built, Joseph is crying because in the tribal lands of Benjamin will include the temples and they will be destroyed. And Benjamin cries on Joseph's neck because although Joseph's land does not include the land of the temple, it does include the land of Mishkan Shiloh the temporary temple in Shiloh, not the Civil War battle location, but in the land of Israel. Before Jerusalem was acquired, the temple was in Shiloh, in the homeland, in the ancestral land of Joseph. And that's why Benjamin is crying on the shoulders, sorry, on the neck of Joseph. So again, we're told that the neck is somehow associated with the temple. And it makes sense to us right now because that is the location where the connection between the holy and the mundane is. And that's where the luz is there. That's that spine, the top of the spine by the neck. And that's what's happening over here. Jacob is trying to ferret out. He's trying to uncover and reveal that little point of holiness that's touching, that is immersed amongst all that mundane sheepness. Now, this idea, of course, is very lofty. I promised you it would be exotic. I believe I have kept my word. But certainly, the number one takeaway of this is that we have to banish the notion that the Torah is telling us some narrative, some useless narrative, without any world-shaking consequences. Sometimes you have to dig a little deeper 
and go find out what our sages say to understand what's actually happening. But this, to me, is eye-opening because it gives so much color and insight to what otherwise seems like just poor negotiation, coupled with a very big emphasis on sheep that seem to carry no weight. But the Kabbalists, of course, reveal the deep insights behind it. Now, this principle of discovering holiness and unearthing holiness that is behind the scenes, beneath the surface, behind the facade, covered by the veneer. This idea is found in many places in our philosophy. And I think we've spoken about this in the past, but I'm starting to lose track of what we've spoken about and what we haven't spoken about. We need an official Parsha podcast archivist. Send me your resume to rabbi.com. But when Jacob, when he chooses to hightail out of Laban's household, the verse tells us, this is in chapter 31, verse 2, that Jacob saw the face of Laban and behold, it's not like it was in the past, not yesterday, not the day before. Jacob chooses to leave when Laban's face changed. Now, our parsh is a story of Jacob in exile. And everything that happens to the antecedents of the Jewish people, to the patriarchs in the book of Genesis, is really a microcosm of what will happen to their descendants as a nation. And over the course of our history, we've also gone to exile. We've been in Israel, then we were kicked out, and then we came back, and we were kicked out again, and we've been to every country, almost every country in the world. We talked about the 42 different countries that the Jewish people will have to settle in before we can finally come back for good. What are we supposed to do in the exile? What is the objective of the Jewish people in exile? So the Talmud tells us, this is the Talmud, we don't have to go to the Kabbalistic sources. The Talmud tells us, the book of Pesachim, on page 87b, the Almighty only sent the Jewish people into exile for the purpose of gathering converts. There is holiness found all over the place. And our mission is to collect and curate that holiness. And of course, that holiness comes in a lot of different dimensions. Part of it is that we, we have Jewish souls that are trapped in foreign lands amongst foreign nations. And our nation is on this mission to collect all that holiness and to bring it back home. Says the Talmud, why do we go to exile? Why is our nation subjected to being wandering and itinerant from place to place, a couple hundred years here and a couple hundred years there, and Morocco and Tunisia and France and Germany and Russia and Ukraine and Iraq, Iran, and every other place in between, Egypt, of course, quite memorably, and even the far-flung corners of these United States of America. Why? Why? We're there to collect those parts of holiness. And Jacob's story in our parsha is really a microcosm of that. He's there to collect the holiness, the parts of holiness, in the sheep. But the sages reveal that there was more holiness that Jacob was collecting. Even Laban, even Laban, his father-in-law, had some holiness buried within him. And Jacob, a man on a mission in the exile, he's there to collect that, to elevate that. And when does he decide to leave? When he looks at the face of Laban, and it's not like the way it was, not yesterday, not the day before. Jacob had spent his 20 years with Laban, pulling out holiness from wherever he found it, in the sheep and in Laban. And there came a point in time 
where the holiness was completely extracted from Laban. He was depleted. The holiness was exhausted from Laban. And Jacob was able to see that. He could look at the face of Laban and determine how many sparks of holiness. Is there any holiness left? And Jacob tells his wives, I look at your father's face and it's not like it was. Now the holiness is all gone. I've succeeded in my mission over here. I've removed all the holiness. It's time to leave. That's the story of the Jewish people on a macro scale. We go to a place. We spend a couple hundred years there. And then we leave. And of course, there are forces that shove us out because we get quite comfortable. Ah, I kind of like it over here. It's so wonderful in my dacha. In my chateau. I'm used to the culture here. I'm used to the cuisine here. This is where I grew up and this is where I raised my kids and this is where I felt comfortable. But if your national mission is over, the Almighty will unleash forces that will boot you to your next destination, to your next mission. Jacob is modeling that for us. He has succeeded in extracting all the holiness in the sheep and in Laban. And even he can look at Laban's face and find out it's down to zero. There's nothing left. All the holiness has been exhausted. It's time to go back home. And that's really what's happening in our Parsha. Jacob is in exile. And what does he do in exile? He discovers and he unearths and he extracts and he elevates all the sparks of holiness. And once he's done, it's time to go bring them back to the Holy Land. Now, these ideas, of course, are very lofty. And I'm sure some of y'all are saying, oh no, Rabbi Walby's on one of his rants. The torch center is pulsating with all this energy. What's happening over here? It's one of those kinds of Parsha podcasts. What does this have to do with me? I'm a simple guy. I'm not so advanced like Jacob. I have no idea if there's any holiness anywhere. Even in myself, I don't know. What can possibly be the lesson for us simpletons? I think there's a very basic lesson for all of us. Yes, it is our national mission to assemble all of holiness. The holiness that's scattered, we have to gather it. Certainly, that demands that we extract and elevate the holiness that is within us. Like the Luz bone, there's some point of holiness within us that is indestructible. We have tremendous potential. We have a soul. And that holiness needs to be fanned to life and brought to actualization. And Jacob shows us that this is this is our mission. He spent 20 years with Laban trying to do this. And we may look at ourselves, and we all know that we have tremendous untapped potential within us. But we get disheartened. Oh, there's so much work to do. How much work do we need to do to make ourselves into the best versions of ourselves? But Jacob shows us, he models for us how worthwhile it is. He was willing to dedicate seven years to achieve this, to just take it out. And once circumstances warranted, they had to go back to square one. He did so calmly and willingly. He did a massive seven-year project twice. And then he spent six more years putting on the finishing touches. There's a common axiom in Israel, which I absolutely love. I haven't heard it so much here. Am Hanetzach, the eternal nation, is unfazed by a long road. Am Hanetzach, the eternal nation, is not scared, is not fearful 
is unfazed, does not flinch miderach arukah from a long road. We've been here for, for a long time. Our national mission and destiny have been front and center for a very, very long time. We're deeply committed to this, and we have been for a long time. Lots of things come and go, lots of fads, and lots of interests, and lots of focuses, and the news cycle is shrinking and shrinking as our time span becomes indistinguishable from that of a goldfish. You remember COVID? It was such a dominant subject, and now it just doesn't appear in the news. It's kind of faded away. Yesterday, my son, I was taking him to school. He's like, Abba, is, is there still a war in Ukraine? That just dominated the news cycle for a long time. And then it went away. Of course, it's still in the news. But my son's like, is there still a war? Has that been resolved? You read about, you know, the founding fathers of the United States and what they cared about and what they envisaged for the United States that they were founding. And their ideals were very powerful. And things changed. And the country transposed. Things come and go. Ideals and values and priorities, they shift and they change fast. But look at our people. It's been, what, 3,500 years? And we're still at it with vigor and commitment and devotion and passion. A passion that has not dimmed. Maybe it's dimmed. But it has not been snuffed out. And of course, we've had our ups and downs and our ebbs and flows. And our apogees. Did I pronounce that correctly? Apogees and nadirs. But we're still at it 3,500 years later, centuries, millennia after Laban and Jacob were wrestling for these souls. We're still here doing what Abraham got us started to do. We're playing the long game. And every individual amongst us, our individual microcosmic mission mirrors the national mission on a macro scale, we're trying to take all that holiness and extract it both within ourselves and within the world. And we are unfazed by how long it may take. And the Mishnah reminds us, Lo alecha hamlecha more. The work is not upon you to complete. However, you are not free to abandon it. Let's get to the question of the week. We're trying to get a little smarter about the Parsha and everything else. The one thing that is clinically proven to make us sharper, more intelligent, more discerning is Torah study. And here's our question. Our Parsha is a story of exile. It begins with Jacob leaving his homeland and he's empty-handed and he's penniless and he's alone. And 20 years later, it ends with him returning back to his homeland. Now he has an empire, a retinue, 12 children, four wives, untold possessions. And then we have a whole, a whole cycle of exile and reclamation. And the truth is, our life here, as humans, is akin to exile. Our soul, its roots are in heaven, and it comes here for 70, 80, 90, 100 years, 150 years, whatever. Well, hopefully, we live for a long time. But we're in a, a place and a setting that is very foreign and hostile to our soul. And its goal, like Jacob's goal in our parsha, is just to get back intact. When Jacob undertakes his journey, all he asks for is to come back in peace to the home of my father. 
His chief concern is to survive this exile intact and unharmed. That is precisely what our soul covets when it is thrust into the world, when it's sent into exile. That's the story of our Parsha, Parsha of exile. But why does Jacob have to go into exile? That's the question. In the Torah, there is a very specific crime that is punished with exile. And that is murder, and specifically accidental murder. Why is Jacob in that category? So the Midrash says something so shocking. It just, it's almost completely befuddling to us. Jacob was a murderer. What? <laughs> Jacob was a murderer! Not a willful murderer, but an accidental murderer. Where, where is that in the text? Do you remember? Did I miss it? Jacob is an accidental murderer? Where is that? Citation needed. Says the Midrash, he was an accidental murderer because he accidentally murdered Asav. Asav? What do you mean? Asav's still alive. We meet him in Etri's parasha. Yes, he's still alive. But spiritually, Jacob gave up on his brother. And if someone murders a body, you go into exile. Certainly if you murder a soul, you go into exile. But Jacob didn't do it willfully. But to a certain extent, Jacob is culpable. He is to blame for Asav's spiritual devolvement. Jacob didn't do anything actively to spiritually limit and encumber and suppress Asav. But he had the ability to save him. And even Asav was salvageable. And Jacob is punished as if he were an accidental murderer because he should have tried really hard to improve Asaph spiritually and to draw him back to God's good graces. And yes, it wasn't willful. God rendered it only as an accidental spiritual murder, and that's why his sole punishment was that he went into exile. This is an astonishing idea. The verse tells us that we cannot stand idly as our brother's blood is being shed. If this is true for someone's physical, temporary blood, certainly it's true. If their spiritual, permanent selves is dying, the soul, like the body, needs nourishment, needs sustenance, needs life, needs vitality. Unlike the body, it's not physical, it's spiritual. The soul needs Torah. It needs mitzvos. It needs a connection to the divine for it to be sustained. And if you withhold spiritual vitality from a soul, the soul begins to suffer and wither and maybe even die. Asaph was spiritually dying and Jacob stood idly and did nothing. And as a result, he had to go into exile. This is a shocking idea that the Midrash tells us. And I think it is a reminder of the great responsibility that we have towards our brethren. Your spiritual life is much more important and permanent than your physical life. The Midrash tells us, that if someone causes another person to sin, it's worse than if they killed him. Why? Because if you kill someone physically, they're dead in this world, but in the permanent world, they're still alive. 
But if you cause someone to sin and you cause them to veer off the path of eternal spiritual life, not only are they gone in this world, but they're gone in the next world. If someone is spiritually dying, we must do what we can. We cannot stand idly. We must do what we can to save them. If someone does not have a strong connection with their creator, if they don't have a connection to spiritual vitality, to spiritual food, they're spiritually on the brink. And if we stand by and do nothing, there's a very credible case to be made that such an oversight amounts to a degree of spiritual manslaughter. Spiritually standing idly while someone is dying. This is a very important reminder of the imperative of us spreading Torah and spreading awareness of mitzvahs and spreading awareness of the Almighty to all that we encounter. And I'll make a little pitch. You know, we're approaching the end of the year. And many of y'all have said over the course of 2022, I want to partner with the good folks at the Torch Center, the good folks at Torch, at the Parsha Podcast in Houston, Texas, because they are working at this 24, 24 six, call it 24 seven, because we work in Shabbos as well, though not on the electronics. This is what we do. We are the firefighters and the EMTs for the soul, for spirituality. If you cannot spiritually feed your brethren yourself, you should outsource it. Outsource your responsibility to engage in life-saving efforts. Outsource it to us. Because we will work tirelessly to bring all that we can. Every person that we can reach, every person that we can influence to bring them closer to God and to his Torah and to his mitzvot. And to hopefully through that infuse them with the critical spiritual vitality needed to flourish as a soul. So if that means sending the podcasts, sharing the podcasts with your friends, with your family, of course you could do this yourself. Invite your friends over for Shabbos. Get them involved in prayer. Get them involved in learning. Get them involved in a mitzvah. But also, making sure that you invest in our organization, Torch. The website is torchweb.org. The link is in the description because by partnering with us, you are contributing towards, I don't want to be boastful here, but one of the most significant efforts in the world to spread knowledge of the Almighty and his Torah and his mitzvot to everyone. And I thank you. I thank you for listening to this podcast and for all the incredible listenership that we are so fortunate to have here at the Parsha Podcast at the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. My name is Yaakov Walby. Walby is spelled W-O-L-B-E. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Have an incredible day. Have a fantastic rest of your week and a splendid, uplifting, meaningful, fabulous, serene, tranquil Shabbos upcoming. And please don't help me the money. We'll talk again in good health and in upbeat spirits next week.